Uh, OK, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I suppose most of you or everybody uh, will know Keith, but I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, Keith Mankish is currently uh, an honorary professor in the philosophy department at the University of Sheffield, a visiting research fellow at the OU, where he was formerly a senior lecturer and an adjunct professor with the Brain and Mind program at the University of Crete. Uh, his work is mainly in the philosophy of mind, in particular defending the stance that phenomenal consciousness uh, is an introspective illusion. Uh, and today he'll be talking on why we can know it's like what it's like to be a bat and bats can't. Um, OK, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Azita. Um, OK, so I'm sorry you can't see me, but um, you'll see the slides and uh, the slides are quite pretty, so probably prettier than I am. Um, so let's let's talk about bats. Why we can know what it's like to be a bat, bats can't. I don't think there's any good sense in which um, we can talk about what it's like to be a bat, in which uh, there's anything hidden from us. Okay, so just a moment. There we go. So let's begin where well, you might expect to begin with Thomas Nagel on what it's like. Famous paper, I guess most of you have read it, perhaps all of you have. What is it like to be a bat? 1974. Uh, Nagel's interested in consciousness, what it is to have conscious mental states and he says this, that an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it is like to be that organism. He stresses be there, something that it is like to be. We'll come back to this business of being like something to be. If it is something that it is like to be that organism, something it is like for the organism, there's a lot packed in there. And uh, Every subjective phenomenon uh, is essentially connected with a single point of view. So to understand what it's like to be a bat, to understand it, that it, the subjective nature of its experience, we have to understand the bat's point of view. But if I try to imagine this, if I try to imagine what it's like to be a bat. If I try to imagine occupying the bat's point of view, I am restricted to the resources of my own mind. Those resources are inadequate. It came about what he can imagine. He can only imagine himself being in the sort of position that a bat would be, that a bat is in, flying around in the dark and so on. He's imagining himself uh, acting in a bat-like way. He's not actually imagining being a bat. That's what he wants to imagine. But then he has to imagine having quite different sensory apparatus from his own. He has to imagine having quite a different mind from his own, quite a different life from his own. He can't do that. So it goes on, if the facts of experience are accessible only from one point of view, that's putting together the first two claims there, the facts of experience are accessible only from one point of view, then it's a mystery how the true character of experiences could be revealed in the physical operation of the organism, because of course the description of the physical operation of an organism does not, he thinks, uh, cannot, he thinks, characterize that point of view. The only way to get into a bat's point of view would be imaginatively, and he doesn't have resources to do that, uh, any scientific description is going to miss out the, um, the essentially subjective nature of it, the point of view. So it goes something like this, I think. For a creature to be conscious is for there to be something it's like to be a creature. For it to be something that it's like to be a creature is to have a subjective point of view. A subjective point of view is only knowable from that point of view or from a suitably similar one. 
or imaginative projection or something like that. But a physical description abandons the subjective point of view. So it's a mystery how physicalism could be true. Maybe physicalism is true, but maybe that the bat's experience, bat, the bat's consciousness is just a physical phenomenon, but it's a mystery how it could be. Because we can't see how we could capture what it's like to be a bat in any physical description, which is presumably what we'd be able to do if physicalism were true. Okay, you can pick all sorts of holes in that, but I think the general line of argument is clear enough. Now, the best response to Nagel was written by Brian Farrell, nearly a quarter of a century before Nagel published his paper. In his paper, published in 1950, called Experience, published in Mind. If you haven't read it, then I urge you, only if you're at all interested in this subject, then I urge you to go and read it. Um, I think they, uh, in fact, in this paper, Farrell asked this question. I wonder what it would be like to be, or hear like, a bat. He actually um, introduces that topic. I think, uh, I think Nagel has, I think Nagel has acknowledged that he did read Farrell's paper, though uh, he wasn't, he didn't recall it at the time of writing um, the paper. Um, but unlike Nagel, Farrell says that we thinks that we can know what it's like to be a bat. He gives that as an example of something we can know. Because Farrell denies that the facts of experience are accessible only from one point of view. He argues that experience itself is featureless. There's nothing to know about experience itself. This is what he says, the experience of X, X being the subject, is featureless because there is nothing about it that X can discriminate. If he, he uses the masculine, if he does discriminate something that appears to be a feature of the experience, this something becomes uh, at once becomes roughly either a feature of the stimulus in the sort of way that the saturation of the red in the red shape is a feature of the red shape or a feature of his own responses to the shape. So his thought is that if you interrogate your own experience, if you pay attention to it, all that you find are either features of the stimulus or features of your response to the stimulus. Beyond that, there's nothing. Experience is featureless. Experience itself is featureless. Here's an example. He, he uses opium smoking as an example. I suppose it's a, every one has their own preferred examples. When I take up opium smoking and learn what it is like to be an opium smoker, I do not learn anything more about it except what uh, except what the scientific methods of the non-privileged observer are still too clumsy to discover for themselves. So it doesn't discover anything that science couldn't discover, just things that science hasn't is currently too clumsy to discover. All that happens when I become a privileged observer is that I give myself the opportunity of making certain observations for myself. I give myself the opportunity of making the same discriminations, etc., as the opium smoker, of learning to react to these as he does, and so of coming to know what it is like to be an opium smoker. So occupying the point of view doesn't give you access to anything uh, that would not be available to other people who, 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 who don't occupy the position. It just gives you a an easier route to making the relevant discriminations. OK, so what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk really is just um, amplify a bit on Farrell's case and set it out from my own perspective with some of my own terminology and try to illuminate essentially the same points, but with a, a, different, uh, a different way of, uh, of carving up the uh, a different set of concepts for carving up the area. So let's begin with this. What is it to have a subjective point of view? That's when Nagel started, of course, that to be conscious is to be like something for an organism, and that is for it to have a subjective point of view. Well, what is it to have a subjective point of view or subjectivity, we might say? Well, 
there are a few things you can say about a subjective point of view. It's it's relative to a topic or domain to have a have a, a subjective point of view on something, on politics, on art, on the world around you. And it consists. I take it that this is all fairly uh, controversial. It consists in a set of personal responses to features of the domain. My point of view on politics is a set of personal responses uh, to the world of politics, a set of beliefs and hopes, fears, and so on. My point of view on the world around me is a set of personal responses to the world around me. And what makes it subjective is that these are personal responses to my responses. And it requires an ability to discriminate different features of the domain and respond to them in a selective and systematic way. I've got to be able to note particular uh, features of the world of politics and respond to them in a in my own um, particular way. And it, it has to be, I think, systematic in order for it to add up to a coherent point of view. If it's not systematic, if I keep changing my opinions every few uh, minutes, then I won't have a consistent point of view. Similarly, my point of view on the world around me consists in my ability to detect features of the world and respond to them in my own distinctive way. And these responses may be of many kinds. They can be psychological, uh, sorry, physiological responses, or really, responding to the world in all sorts of bodily ways, physiological ways that we may not be uh, directly aware of. Uh, somebody looks threatening, and there will be all sorts of physiological changes you will undergo. There will be physio uh, psychological changes, changes in emotion, motivation, and belief, and so on. A whole raft of psychological changes to things happening around you. And of course, there will be behavioural changes. And the whole suite of those constitutes, I say, your point of view on whatever the domain is. And the pattern of responses associated with a certain discriminable feature indicates the significance that feature has for you, for the creature. So the pattern of responses associated with a certain political topic indicates what that topic means for me. Similarly, the pattern of responses associated with my discriminating certain uh, properties indicates the significance of those properties. Now, that's how I think of subjectivity. And I want to distinguish three kinds of subjectivity, which I'll call perceptual, introspective, and the intrinsic. Let's begin with perceptual. And we'll focus on the bat's subjectivity, the bat's perceptual subjectivity. Now, perceptual subjectivity is a subjective take, in the sense just described, on the world or the environment immediate environment, which can include uh, one's own body. So it's a personal set of perceptual sensitivities indicated by the red lines and physiological, psychological and behavioural responses indicated by the green arrows. Sensitivities to particular features, of course, and responses to them. And this set of responses is shaped by all sorts of factors, including genetics, development, and learning, and your own experience, your own past experience. Can we know the facts of a bat's perceptual subjectivity? Yes. This is what psychology is all about. This is what experimental psychology is for. We can experimentally investigate what stimuli the bat can discriminate and what reactions different stimuli produce. We can engineer, devise protocols that will tease out all of the different responses, including ones that are not overt. We can engineer 
situations and experimental situations which will manifest the non-overt psychological reactions that the bat has. That's what psycho psychological experimentation is all about. It's finding conditions under which there is some distinctive um, difference in response corresponding to some psychological difference. It may not be easy, but we can certainly do it. So to give it a little simple example of that, what do you think it's like for a bat to perceive a shiny surface? There's bats flying around in a room where there are panes of glass or other kinds of polished surface. What do you think it's like for the bat to perceive them? Is it a bit like it would be for us to hear a high-pitched noise, say? Um, do, they, do they seem loud and screechy? Surfaces, what do they seem like? Well, you can find out. Bats have impressive echolocation skills. Most of the time. Unfortunately, they have a bit of a problem with smooth surfaces. Bats navigate in the dark by listening for the echoes of their own high-frequency calls. Objects with rough surfaces reflect sound waves in many different directions. But smooth surfaces can act as an acoustic mirror, reflecting most of the sound away from the incoming bat. Only when the bat is directly over this metal sheet can it detect a few reflected sound waves. The bats in this experiment often only realised the metal plate was there at the very last minute. None of these bats were injured. But in the wild, smooth glass on the outside of buildings can be an invisible menace for echolocating bats. Well, it's not like anything. You can't detect them until they're very, very close. Invisible. Um, what's, the, what's the word for the undetectable by echolocation? Unecholocatable. They're just not part of its subjective world. They don't figure in it. So then, that's something we can learn. And so we can go on doing experiments like this, mapping the bat's informational and reactive engagement with its environment, all the things it's sensitive to, and all the responses to the things it's sensitive to. And in principle, with enough ingenuity, enough time, enough funding, we could map it all. So I'll indicate that that very complex informational and reactive engagement there with by these by these two broad arrows that indicates all the the complex patterns of interaction. And we could call this I call this perceptual consciousness. Perceptual consciousness is just this rich informational and reactive engagement with your environment. Environment here also includes your own body through um, body senses of various kinds, proprioception, pain, experience, and so on. Uh, with enough experimental work, we can know all about these sensitive sensitivities and reactions. So it is not necessary to occupy a particular perceptual point of view in order to know all the facts about it. That's my claim. I mean, if you'd like to give me some example of a, a sensitivity and pattern of reactions that we couldn't experimentally investigate in this way, I'd be interested, but I can't think of what it might be. Okay, so it's not necessary. Is it sufficient? Uh, does the bat know the facts of its own perceptual subjectivity? Well, does the bat know about its own sensitivities and reactions? 
Well, not, I think, simply in virtue of possessing them. Has all these sensitivities, has all these reactions. Does it know that it has them? That's a different matter. And uh, I don't see how simply possessing them would be enough for it to know about them. For it to know about them, it would need another kind of subjectivity, what I'll call introspective subjectivity. And this is another kind of subjective take, not on the world this time, but on one's own perceptual subjectivity, one's own perceptual consciousness, on one's own patterns of sensitivity and reaction. And what this is going to require is some sort of self-monitoring system that is sensitive to your own sensory and reactive states. That is, you need to be, not only need to be sensitive to the world, you also need to be sensitive to your own sensitivities and react to your own reactions. Higher order sensitivities, higher order reactions. So here these little red and green arrows are patterns of sensitivity and reaction, not now to the world, but to the bat's own first order sensitivities and reactions. It detects what it's detecting and reacts to its own reacting. And again, there will be a rich informational and reactive engagement with its own first order consciousness, just like it can have a rich information and reactive engagement with its own, with its environment. We'll call that introspective consciousness. So first order consciousness consists in, uh, perceptual consciousness consists in the first order sensitivities and reactions. Introspective consciousness consists in higher order sensitivities and reactions. And there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't map all of these, these higher order sensitivities, in just the same way as we could map the first order ones. It would require some very clever experimental work, but it, it certainly could be done. These sensitivities and reactions are going to show up in behavior in the right circumstances. Now, do bats have? introspective consciousness. That's what they need to have in order to be aware of their own perceptual consciousness. Well, what use would they make of the information? What could you do with this information? What sort of reactions does this sort of higher order sensitivity facilitate? Well, this is, this is a, a big question, but the obvious answers are control and communication. If you, if you have this kind of um, this kind of higher order sensitivity, then it allows you to exercise some control over those first order processes. If you find that certain things produce very produce reactions in you that are very pleasant, that are very positive, then you can cultivate those experiences, seek out the things that cause them. And again, if you note that other things produce aversive reactions, you can avoid them. Of course, you'll already be see, you'll already be drawn to those things uh, and pushed the first things and pushed away from the, 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 the light of in virtue of the first order processes themselves. But the higher order processes allow you to take a more strategic attitude to this. You don't just have to wait until something impinges upon you and find out that it's nice and you have all the, the reactions. You can plan this, you can think ahead, you can take strategic attitudes towards your own experience in virtue of having this sort of reflective awareness of it. And you can also communicate about this. You can tell other people what sort of reactions certain things provoke in you, warn them against things that produce aversive reactions, uh, <clears throat> encourage them to try things that produce uh, positive reactions. Do bats do any of that? Uh, well, I don't know. 
bunch about bats, but I'd be very surprised if they did. Um, without language, they can't do much in the way of communicating about their own mental states. And uh, I, I don't know. They, I'm open to finding evidence of it, but I suspect I'd, I'd be very surprised if there were any. I don't know of any evidence. I, I, I'd very much doubt they have that. If you want to come up with some evidence, I'd be fascinated to hear it. But if that's right, if they don't, then in this perceptual sense, we can know what it's like to be a bat. We can know all the facts about a bat's perceptual subjectivity, but the bat itself can't, because it doesn't have any way of detecting them. So then it's not sufficient to occupy a particular perceptual point of view in order to know all, or indeed any of the facts about it. So we can, and bats can't. Okay. So it's, let's suppose you buy all of that. Then it looks like Nagel's completely wrong. Uh, how did it ever seem to him otherwise? Why did he think there was a sort of subjectivity, some kind of point of view that's inaccessible to us and accessible to the bat? I think it's because he was thinking of subjectivity in another way as what I call intrinsic subjectivity. And this is, well, hmm, hard to put it. It's something like a subjective take on, on being itself. What is it like to be a bat? Not what, a, what it is likeness that consists in sensitivity to features, either of the world or of your own mind. But, I mean, it's, it's hard to to articulate it, but what it is like simply to be that creature, to for that creature simply to exist. What it's like to be a bat, not what it is like for a bat to be aware of something. It's a static, intrinsic, essential kind of subjectivity, not just words and gestures, not a dynamic kind like the others. And this, of course, is reflected in our talk of the intrinsic quality of experience, the idea, distinct from all sensitivities and reactions. So the idea is that when you're having, when you're experiencing things around you, yes, you're detecting features of the world and you're responding to them, and you're maybe detecting your own detecting of them and responding to that. And that's all something that can be captured in terms of processes that are occurring your brain, say. But there's supposed to be an intrinsic quality to all of this that's distinct from all of that. The word intrinsic keeps coming back. It's, it's a slippery and I'm not, not think it's a very helpful word, but it's what the experience is like in itself, independent, distinct from what it tells you about, what it's telling you about the world, what about your reactions to the world. And so here what I've got is this inner glow uh, that somehow created, which is not dynamic, which is not part of this cycle of information and reaction, but is, again, intrinsic. And this is what people call raw feel, quality, phenomenal feel, or what it is likeness of experience. We can talk about what experience is like in the way that I have been doing. I talked about perceptual subjectivity and introspective subjectivity. But now we're talking about it's what it is likeness. We've reified that idea of what experience is what it's like. And this is often, this kind of subjectivity is often thought to be self-revealing to the subject. You don't actually need to do anything in order to know what it's like, what your experience is like in this sense. You don't have to detect it. It's just, you're just immediately aware of it. You're just acquainted with it as the phrase goes. It's, you know it by being it, as it were. Um, and this, of course, is how people find it coherent, meaningful to talk of, uh, to adopt a panpsychist view where inanimate objects have something that it's like to be them. Atoms, electrons have something that it's like to be them. They don't, of course, have perceptual subjectivity. They don't detect features. They don't have any psychology. They don't detect things and respond to things but they still exist. And so they could still have this intrinsic subjectivity 
some sort of self-revealing essence. And so, I think we can see now, if you think of subjectivity in that way, why, why you get this intuition that it's private, because how on earth would you detect this inner quality of experience? There's, there's nothing dynamic there. There's no reactions you can look out for. There's nothing you can, you can measure, record. There's no way you can create an experimental setup to detect this inner nature of the thing. Um, but yet they're supposed to be revealed directly, immediately to the subject. So here we do seem to have something that the bat would know, and we wouldn't. Intrinsic consciousness. Now we have, say we could not discover the intrinsic subjectivity of a bat. There's absolutely no experimental method that could determine it. We might, and this is what some scientists do who believe in this kind of um, consciousness, we might assume that it is correlated with certain reactions and look out for those reactions. And then perhaps correlate those reactions with things that are happening in the brain and say that these things that are happening in the brain are the neural correlates of the intrinsic feel. But you have to start with an assumption of a link between a certain link between reactions and intrinsic feel. No way you can test that. It has to be done on a priori grounds. In the end, it's a matter of intuition. And for the life of me, I can't see how a bat could discover it either. Yes, it's supposed to be self-revealing to the bat, but There's no introspective mechanism that could detect it any more than there's an experimental method that would allow us to detect it, detect it. And I just don't see how it's self-revealed. Self-revealed to what? Um, to parts of the bat's brain? Um, to the whole of the bat's brain? I mean, I don't understand what it could be revealed to. And without an introspective mechanism. This is the point here is not simply that bats don't have introspective mechanisms, but even if they had them, they couldn't detect this intrinsic character any more than our experimental methods could. We're still just on a par with the, with the bat. Moreover, I would say that there is nothing here to discover anyway. What features of its experience could a bat discover distinct from features of objects that it's paying attention to and its reactions to them. Even if it had introspective mechanisms, what other features could it detect? Pay careful attention to your experience and tell me what it is about your experience that you're aware of that is not a feature of something in the world or a feature of your reactions to the things in the world. This is exactly what Farrell means by, talk, by saying that experience itself is featureless. So I say that a bat can't know what it's like to be it intrinsically. Maybe, however, we could do something. Maybe we could imagine what it would be like for a bat to have intrinsic subjectivity. How could we do that? Well, we need to think about how it is that we come to conceive of ourselves as having intrinsic subjectivity. I think intrinsic subjectivity is illusory, but I don't think it's just nothing at all. It's uh, something we believe ourselves to possess. Um, these intrinsic feels, Qualia, they don't actually exist, but they are intentional objects for us. That's why I talk about illusion. And how do we come to have this illusion? Here's the thought. It's only introspectively conscious creatures who are subject to this illusion. 
introspectively conscious creatures can detect their own sensory states and the reactions they generate. They have this second loop here. Well, it's very schematic, of course. So they can respond to their own experiences. And this enables them to talk about their experiences. They can describe how things are affecting them. And I think that's one of the chief functions of this loop. I think it's, it's social creatures who really need it or can really exploit it and use it. It enables them to tell each other how the world's affecting them. Very useful thing to be able to do. You don't just, not limited simply to reacting to the world, you can share information about how you react to the world and adopt strategies for producing the reactions you like. However, this sort of introspective monitoring is not fine-grained. It doesn't need to be. We don't need to have access to all the gory detail of what's happening in our sensory cortices um, and all the huge waves of psychological reactions that are occurring. We don't, we don't need all that. We just need a sense of its global nature, the sensory modality, is it vision, is it hearing, whatever. The relation of one experience to another, is this brighter or darker than another, is it, where is it on the, on the spectrum, what's its saturation, its hue, and this sort of thing. Uh, its valence, is it something that's evoking a positive response or a negative response, they, those sorts of things. We need some sort of general idea of, of what it's like. We don't need to know all the all the messy details. And we express this by saying that our experiences have distinctive fields, which is, it's like saying, well, it's an experience of that sort of kind, you know, and you gesture at a few features about it that you can. Um, perhaps talking, referring to what provokes it. It's salty, it's the sort of taste you get from salt, it's that sort of thing. It's a gesture, it's a sort of caricatured, simplified, uh, model of the thing. That kind of experience, the one that does that sort of thing to you. Uh, that's all we can say. And what such talk is actually tracking is a very complex pattern of sensitivities and reactions, which are perfectly objective, if you like, perfectly available um, to third person investigation. We don't tease apart all the different strands of this pattern. We just see the overall shape of it and we just say it's, it's, it's a that sort of feel. And we take such talk to refer to simple intrinsic qualities, feels. Those qualities themselves are illusory. Um, it's an illusion produced by something perfectly real, a set patterns, reactions and sensitivities. But the caricature of it that we use in communication, talk about fields, so that's illusion. Nice example that Daniel Dennett has here, which um, we often uses of the, the, um, the user interface on a computer, on your computer, the desktop, with its little icons for the files and folders and programs, waste basket and so on. Um, that's a very simplified, very simplified caricature representation of immensely complex states within the computer file is really just a huge data string distributed over all sorts of different locations on the, the hard disk say. Um, but representing it as a little file, a little physical object that you could pick up and move around makes it vastly more easier for you to use the, the machine. Um, so it's a useful user illusion. Nothing wrong with it at all. It's very, it's very useful. The mistake would be to think that there actually is something in there that that looks like a file, that has the sort of characteristics that a file has, or a waste bin has, or a folder, has, and start looking for these things and wondering how the computer produces them, looking inside the computer at all the, the microelectronics and thinking, yes, but how on earth does all of that produce 
a file or a folder. I think that's the sort of mistake we're making when we try to look for these fields, these qualia. Now, back to the bat, the bats. We imagine the bat to have intrinsic subjectivity. Now, we can't know what it's like to be a bat in that intrinsic sense. There's, there's nothing to know. It does have all these sensitivities. It does have all these reactions. But intrinsic fields that we ascribe, that we want to ascribe to the bat, they don't actually exist. The bat doesn't even think they exist because it doesn't have introspective subjectivity that would produce the illusion of their existence. So, uh, and of course, neither can the bat know. But we could imagine what it is like to be a bat in the intrinsic sense. And here's how we could do it. We could study bat perceptual subjectivity. We could study all these processes, these first order processes of sensitivity and reaction. I talked about earlier. Map them in all as much detail as we possibly could. Then we could use concepts derived from our own introspective subjectivity to imagine the intrinsic subjectivity a bat would believe itself to possess if it had introspective abilities. I don't see there's any reason why we couldn't do that. We could, we could thoroughly get into the bat's perceptual point of view. But thoroughly acquainted with how the bat, how the bat is sensitive to the world and how the world affects the bat. And then imagine if the bat had introspective abilities, how it might start to conceptualize its own experience in the way that we conceptualize our own experience in terms of feels. Now we probably couldn't we couldn't do this um, in a great deal of precision. And after all, it's it's imaginary. It's it's it, we, what we're imagining here is what a bat would imagine itself to have. We're imagining the illusion that a bat would be under if it had introspective abilities. And of course, there's no fact of this matter because it doesn't have introspective abilities, we're assuming. Uh, so we're trying to imagine imagine the, the illusion that introspection would create in a bat if it had it. And we, but we, we could have a go at that. Um, and I think that's essentially the project that Nagel thinks we should uh, to He talks about a, objective phenomenology. That's the, the, the process he thinks we should be engaged on. And, um, and we could do it, though. It's, it's merely investigating a, a hypothetical scenario. But still, there's nothing there that's hidden from us. Insofar as it makes sense to talk about what kind of illusion the bat will be under, we can, we can imagine what that illusion would be like. OK, so I'll round off now. Two questions. If a bat doesn't know what it's like to be itself, does that mean that it doesn't matter what it's like? So I've talked about perceptual subjectivity as well, what it's like for the bat to experience the world, but I'm saying the bat doesn't know what it's like for it to experience the world, just experiencing it. So does it mean it doesn't matter? Well, emphatically, no, that doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that it doesn't matter what it's like to be a bat. All the potency of consciousness, the impact, the oomph, if you like, is, lies in perceptual consciousness. Things impinge upon the bat. They say they hurt it. They produce aversive reactions. That's where all the, the potency of consciousness is, in that first order engagement with the world. And that's what I think we should be sensitive to and uh, respond to when we consider how we treat bats is <laughs> what sort of reactions are we invoking in the bat? Positive ones or negative ones? Doesn't matter whether the bat's tracking them, we can track them. And if they're nasty ones, we shouldn't do it. That's what I think. Perceptual consciousness this is what I've just said, is a dynamic interaction with the world. It's the world impacting on a creature and the creature respond, resounding to the impact. I sometimes talk about a, a creature as being like a bell and the world is striking on, on the, uh, the bell and it's resounding. 
Now, introspective consciousness provides a creature with further capacities with respect to that interaction. It can detect the nature of the interaction. But it doesn't make the impact itself more potent. It doesn't change the nature of the impact. First order pain is still as potent and horrible, whether it's detected or not. Not horrible in an in yeah. intrinsic sense, of course, but horrible in the sense that it's packed with all kinds of aversive responses. That's what it is. But introspective consciousness doesn't do something extra. It doesn't make a light come on, doesn't make an intrinsic feel come on, which is the source of ethical value. It doesn't do that. We don't. That's not where the, 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 the value of the ethical concern lies, not in some uh, hidden intrinsic feel. It lies in the nature of the first order interaction with the world. Another question. Can we know what it's like to be a bat or an alien or a cow or a dog? A human of different ethnicity or gender. These are all hot questions. Emphatically, yes, we can. If we try hard enough, nothing's hidden from us, it's all there. We just need to look. And once we've looked, we need to decide if we care. There you go. Great, thank you. If we could all uh, unmute, give a round of applause. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.